All right, well, welcome to today's webinar on survey analysis fundamentals. Uh, we have one of our academic ambassadors, Ross Matusalem, who's going to be delivering the webinar today. Uh, my name is Kevin Pockner. I'm here to host and to answer questions. So as the webinar is going on, you'll have uh, the opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A panel. Now, there's also a chat panel um, you're welcome to make a comment there, um, but if you have a question, it'd be best if you put it in the Q&A panel. It will be the easy, easiest for me to monitor the questions and um, answer them. Uh, there's also a poll that was just um, popped up that you should see asking you um, if you use Jump and if you use other software and what that other um, uh, software is. Um, so with that, Ross, are uh, you ready to get going? Sure am. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, everyone, for joining us to learn a little about uh, survey analysis fundamentals in Jump. So today we are going to look at uh, survey data and explore ways of uh, preparing it, visualizing it, uh, and performing some uh, foundational statistical analyses. And then as you're seeing in my Jump journal on the left, if we have a little bit of time, we'll probably talk about uh, some text mining basics for those free response questions. The data set that we're going to look at comes from the American Trends Panel, which is a survey panel um, <clears throat> brought together by the Pew Research Center. It's uh, composed of a little over 10,000 adults selected randomly across the United States, and it's meant to be a nationally representative survey panel that responds to uh, a number of surveys over the course of multiple years, and these surveys uh, encompassing multiple topics. Uh, if you want to learn more, I've just pulled up the main page for the American Trends panel here. And when you receive the follow-up email to this webinar, which will contain a link to all the materials in our Jump Journal, you'll find the link to this page right here if you want to learn more about the American Trends panel. So the data set that we're going to look at is from wave 112 of the ATP. So this is data collected about two years ago in the summer of 2022 on uh respondents' use of uh, social media, as well as their um, consumption of news, uh, especially with respect to politics. So we have a number of items here across uh, 12,147 respondents, for example, asking them, uh, how frequently did they discuss politics? Uh, nearly every day, a few times a week, a few times a month or less often. Or if we scroll Further along, what's your preferred news media type, uh, TV, websites, search, and so forth? You're going to notice we have then 86 total columns in this data set, and the survey questions or items, I may use those terms interchangeably, are generally uh, either nominal or ordinal in nature. So nominal, like uh, preferred news media type or its unordered categories, or ordinal, for example, here, how often do you get news from websites or apps? where we have ordered categories, never, rarely, sometimes, or often. And so uh, just a caveat up front, that's going to be our focus today, uh, uh, analyzing and visualizing survey data composed of nominal and ordinal responses. Of course, you can collect continuous responses as well, and we have uh, plenty of learning materials online to analyze those data uh, You know, using regression and ANOVA and uh, similar techniques. But because these nominal and ordinal responses are so common, uh, in survey data and survey analysis. That's what we're sticking with today. So with this American Trends Panel data set, we're going to explore a number of different things. So as it says in that journal, we're going to look at data preparation, just common data prep steps for surveys. Then we're going to look at data visualization. So for example, just to highlight where we're going, here are three different visualizations, just summarizing the proportion, or I might say share of different responses to the question, what is your preferred news media type? And so here we have a bar chart, a pie chart, and on the right, a graph that may be new to some of you uh, called a tree map. So we'll see how to build a number of different graphs for visualizing survey data. We'll also take a look at performing cross tabulations in Jump's tabulate platform. So here I have a summary table that combines both age and education level as what I'll call grouping variables. They define groups of respondents. And then we look at their response to the question, how frequently do you discuss politics? Uh, nearly every day, a few times a week, a few times a month or less often. And you can see I have both percentages and counts populating this table in a customized format. So we'll see how to make these custom cross tabulations. 
And then we'll also talk statistical analyses. So just to give you one example, here I'm in Jump's categorical platform, which is a platform that was really designed mainly for mass analysis of categorical response data found in surveys. And you can see here, we're looking at uh, the reported frequency with which people discuss politics by their age. And so we can see a uh, cross tabulation table at the top. We have what's known as a share chart at the bottom and then a statistical test. So the test of response homogeneity. So just looking to see whether the ages differ in their distribution of response categories to this uh, discuss politics question. And we can see highlighted in orange that we have a statistically significant result. So this is just a quick preview of some of the things we're going to do today. Uh, so let's actually go back to our data here and talk about data preparation. The table that you're looking at, this jump data table, has actually uh, had a number of data prep steps applied to get to the table that we're looking at now. Typically, we get data in some kind of raw format, maybe a uh, CSV or other text file or maybe another statistical package. Let's open these data uh, from their raw form and take a look at a few prep steps. So I'm going to go to File, Open. And in my survey analysis folder, I'll point out that actually here is the data dump that I got from um, Pew for the Wave 112 of the ATP. And they provide their data in .sav format, which is a file format from another statistical package some of you may actually use. Just know that Jump can open uh, SAV files or save files uh, just by going to File Open and knows how to parse them just fine. So that's a common file type. Uh, you'll see uh, SAS data sets as well. Uh, Jump can open SAS data sets just fine. But we are going to uh, imagine if we're, we have a more general file type here, uh, CSV. And I'm going to go ahead and open that with just the best guess, which Jump is going to guess the format of that CSV, and in this case, brings in the data just fine. So here now we're looking at the raw data, and let's talk about what we need to do with survey data to prepare it. And some of these, well, really all these steps could apply to uh, really any data domain, but these are really, I think, pretty common when faced with survey data specifically. So the first challenge here has to do with the column names. So let me go over to this group of three columns where it says group trust AW112. Let's take a look at what the full column name is here. How much, if at all, do you trust the information you get from national news organizations? Or here we have the same preamble, but then local news organizations. So here we have long, uh, thankfully informative titles about what the survey item was asking, but we may want to cut them down to size a bit. So first off, you may want to find your columns in the column list to the left of your data table. So here's this group trust. And if in this left-hand side, you click into the column name, you can actually type something else. So I'm going to type just trust national news to shorten that a bit. Now, of course, if you're working with a wide data set like this, going one by one might not be that efficient. So I want to point out the fact that when you're working with um, renaming or recoding columns uh, and their headers in bulk, go to the calls menu and under column names, you're going to find recode column names. And this will bring up every existing column name on the left and then allow you to type in a new column name on the right. So for example, I could here type trust local news or trust social media. And now when I click recode, you'll notice that those three columns have all been changed. So don't miss recode column names for creating these short but still informative column names here. Next thing you'll notice, Jump has read in these columns with numeric coding. So here we have coding where one in this case means a lot. I trust national news a lot. Uh, two is less than that. I think it's some of the time, uh, something like this. So with these numbers, it's decided, oh, well, I think that what we have here is continuous data that would be appropriate for, let's say, regression in ANOVA. But we know that actually it's ordinal data. And so we want to change the modeling type in the data table so that Jump handles the data appropriately. You can change the modeling type by clicking on the little icon in the uh, columns list next to each one. So I could just change this to ordinal manually. Or maybe I could shift click, and then on my Mac, I'm going to hold down Command. On Windows, you'd hold down Control and click on one of these and select Ordinal, and that will change all of them 
at once. And so you could do this in bulk. Let's say that all of these news platform questions were ordinal. I could select them all, command click, and change them all to ordinal. And you'll notice here now these summary graphs in the data table have changed from histograms to bar charts. Now, one thing I've noted here, don't miss a particular modeling type. And it's one that you won't find if you just click right on these icons where you find the basic continuous ordinal nominal. And this is the multiple response type. So I think we're all familiar with the types of questions that say check all that apply or choose all that apply. So for example, if I present a long list of social media platforms and say select all the ones that you use, I might end up with a column of data that looks like this, where we have comma delimited values, where each one of these numbers represents a particular social media platform. So in this case, what I might do is go to my column info by right-clicking on the column header. And under modeling type, changing to multiple response. And now look at the graph in the data table for this column. You'll notice that the most common response all the way at the top is 1, 12. It's considering that as a unique string when set to nominal. But when I change it to multiple response, it now parses this by its commas, such that now I can see 12 is the most common response. And if I select that 12, every row that includes 12, even if there are other uh, options selected, is, is highlighted there. And so this multiple response modeling type helps jump all over the place, deal with these multiple responses that are contained in a single comma delimited uh, column here. And now I've been talking about social media numbers, you know, platform 12 or one, that begs the question, well, what really are these? And it's common in survey data to have numeric coding for your categorical responses. So here, the numbers one through 12 capture different social media types. If we go back to our trust national news, one, two, three, four reflect frequent or uh, degree of trust in national news. What we might wanna do is actually recode these in order to uh, have them reflect the, the values that people actually selected when they uh, filled out the survey. So I have a couple options here. I can right click and go to recode, which will allow me to type in new values. So one I said was a lot. Oh, Jumps just asked me if I wanna convert this column to a character column because I'm typing in characters now. I'll say yes. Uh, two was some of the time. Let's see, three was not too much. Four is not at all. And then this 99, which we'll talk about in just a moment, is actually when somebody refused to answer a question. So I'm going to put refused in there. Say I want to recode this in place. And now I have recoded all of these to more informative labels. However, you don't actually have to recode things, especially if you have a large data set. It's more memory intensive to store long strings than single digits. And so what I might do instead is use something called value labels. So I'm going to right click on this next one, which was trust local news. And under the column property, go to value labels. And now I can type in a label. So one or a value, excuse me, and then say what that should be labeled. And that should be a lot. And two was some of the time and so forth. I'm not going to do all of them for the sake of time here. But when I click OK, You'll notice now those changes have been made. So here are the allots, here's some of the time. But underlyingly, it's still just the digits being represented. So this is a nice way to handle your data because you're not actually changing or overwriting the raw data. You're just telling Jump, well, if you see a two here, really what you should do is display for me some of the time. So I prefer to use these value labels as opposed to recoding, but sometimes recoding can be handy. Now, in addition to the value labels, there are a number of other what we call column properties you might want to set. So again, trust national news, this is ordinal, and there is an inherent ordering to the categories. So a lot is more than some of the time, which is more than not too much, which is more than not at all. So we might want to order these appropriately. So under our column properties, I can go to value order and set the order however I want. So let's say I want to move some of the time after a lot then not too much, then not at all, and then refused. As I click OK, you can see that ordering has now been applied in this graph, and it'll be applied everywhere else so that the ordinal ordering of categories here is done correctly. Finally, let's get back to this refused. So you can see in this case, I've selected 15 rows where somebody refused to answer uh, their degree of trust in national news. Now, this may be uh, an 
interesting response category for me, such that if I were to perform a basic statistical analysis, I'd want to include it. So here I'm looking at a distribution analysis. But in many cases, we actually may want to exclude it. We treat this essentially as missing data. So to treat this as missing data, you want to use another column property uh, called the missing value code, and you're going to find it right here. And so what I can do is, in this case, I'd put refused since I recoded 99 to refused. In the other columns where I didn't do the recoding, I might type in 99 here and click OK. And now you'll notice in that header graph, refused is gone. If I pull up that quick report, refused is not uh, included here anymore, but it remains in the data table. So again, I haven't changed the underlying data. I've just told jump for all uh, practical purposes when you're performing analyses or graphs, treat anything that says refused as if the data is actually missing. Now, finally, uh, with these wide data sets, I have a long list of columns here. And when I go to, let's say, launch some analyses, being faced with this long list of columns could be kind of uh, overwhelming or difficult to navigate. So I recommend forming uh, coherent column groups to make this whole process more manageable. So for example, I might take these trust columns and highlight them, right click and go to group columns. And now I have this nice column group that allows me to select all three at once if I want. I can even collapse that group so that uh, this list starts to get cleaned up. And as I group more and more columns uh, together, according to their, you know, the topic of their questions, I start to get a much more manageable column list. So grouping columns is, I think, to, in, in most survey analysis, kind of a necessity to get your table organized properly. Now, of course, there are many more data preparation steps uh, that you might undertake, depending on your data set and its format and content. But I think these steps that we've just covered here will uh, get you a lot of the way towards getting your data ready for analysis. So I'm going to leave this data set behind then and pull up the one that we started with, for which I have produced a number of, or I've already completed a number of data prep steps. I will just highlight, and I actually meant to do this a second ago, the, the tool that I actually used for it is a new one in Jump 18. I know some of us are probably using Jump 18, which was released just a couple months ago, uh, but some of us aren't, so that's why I didn't show this or didn't base the demonstration on this. But if you click on this little icon here, you're going to pull up this new Jump 18 tool called the Columns Manager, which allows you to do all sorts of things like set modeling types or value labels or any other column property, uh, as well as see basic visualizations, so bar charts or histograms for some of your variables. So if you have 18, know that a lot of the things that I just did, uh, you can do kind of in one shot inside this Columns Manager tool. But now let's move on to talk data visualization. If you remember, uh, I started with a simple pie chart, if I can pull it back up here, among some others, uh, showing the relative share of responses uh, to a question about people's preferred news media type. It looks like TV is actually uh, in this ATP wave, the most common, followed by websites and search. This pie chart, very common, is uh, for a way of visualizing a single categorical variable, or that's a, a single nominal or ordinal response. And so we'll take a look in just a second at how to make pie charts, because they are so common. I do want to point out that, of course, uh, and many of us are probably aware, pie charts are a bit controversial, um, and that's because they aren't always so easy to read. For example, if you were to look at search versus social media in the red and light blue, and I were to ask you which one is actually more common, uh, it's very hard to judge based on the angle or area of these slices of the pie. And it's just because the human visual system is not great at comparing angles relative to other things, say like the height of something. Um, but that said, there are ways to get around it. I've actually ordered the pie chart uh, clockwise in decreasing share. So we know that search is slightly more common than social media, even if we can't quite visualize how. But as I've said in the notes here, bar charts and tree maps that we also saw are a good alternative. So let's just see how to make all three of those in just a couple minutes here. We're going to use Graph Builder to make all of these charts. So if you're not familiar with Graph Builder, it's a drag and drop graph, graphing interface. You just find your variable. And this one was, let's see, preferred news media type. 
and you drag it into one of the blue drop zones. In this case, I'm going to put it right in the center. I gave uh, jump one nominal variable, and it gave me by default a bar chart where I have the different levels or uh, response categories on the X, and then the count of each one in the data set on the Y. Up at the top, I have a ribbon of different uh, graph elements, as we call them, and I can select the pie element to pull up the pie chart. Now then to get it ordered like we did before, I can right click where it says preferred news media type and say that I want to order by that variable and we'll do count descending here, which gets us in clockwise fashion. And so I don't have to consult this legend. I'm gonna go over here where it says label and label by row. And what that's going to do then is provide those labels for me right next to their corresponding pie slices, which I can move around. Now, again, uh, you know, pie charts are controversial. I think that perhaps a better way to visualize these data so that we can more easily see the difference between some of these similarly sized pie slices might be a bar chart or tree map, as I mentioned. So let's go ahead and while leaving that up here, just to contrast, let's go back to Graph Builder and build a quick bar chart. Uh, let's see, was under news media types. There we go. So here we have that preferred news media type again. And by default, we have a bar chart. I can, as I did before, right click on preferred news media type and choose to order by ascending or descending. And maybe I'll actually, just to preserve the color, I'll put this in the color role as well. And so now it's a little easier to see that social media is maybe, uh, let's see, about oh, 100 people or so, less than search. You'll notice here, uh, actually, I didn't put it in the notes. That's all right. Let me bring the control panel back up because the default for the bar chart is to display the count on the y-axis. But you can actually change uh, the summary statistic that's depicted by the height of the bars. And so in this case, I might change it to percentage. The relative heights of the bars are the same, but now here, this axis is actually percentage instead of count. And then maybe I'll label by that value as well. And so we can see it's about a 1% difference between search and social media, which is a lot easier to see in this visualization, I think, than in this pie chart here. But there's another, I think, kind of halfway point between these two graphs. Maybe halfway point's not quite fair, but that's the tree map. So much like a bar chart, or excuse me, a pie chart, a tree map, which you can pull up by clicking on this element right here, depicts a relative share proportion by the area. But now we're looking at rectangles as opposed to slices of a pie, which are a little bit easier to uh, compare visually. And if we change our layout on the left to what's known as Squareify, what it's going to do is have the largest response category in the top left and the smallest on the top right. So we know TV is the largest, and here, this is podcasts, or the smallest. We can actually label these as well, as we've been labeling many other things. Let's see if I can find my label here. There we go, size value. So here is the counts, and we could change that to percent of grand total again. And so this is similar to a pie chart in that we're assessing area, but in shapes in a format that might be a little easier to digest. So those are a few options for visualizing your single categorical variables. If we're talking about two categorical variables, we have a couple of options here that are common. One is the stacked bar chart. So here's an example. Looking at the four different age groups that we have, uh, let's see the relative proportion of their trust in social media. So looking at the light blue, which is not at all, you can see an increasing proportion of light blue as age increases. So older people generally don't trust social media as much as younger folks. Uh, that doesn't seem too surprising. Uh, let's see how we would build this bar chart right here. So let's pull Graph Builder back up. So now again, we're working with two categorical variables, making this stacked bar chart. The first thing I'm gonna do is grab that age variable, and I'll call this a grouping variable. Again, it defines different groups of respondents. You can see just looking at the counts, we actually have far fewer people in the young 18 to 29 group than the others. But now instead of having one bar per age group, I want one bar per age group by their trust in social media. 
So let's grab trust in social media. And I'm going to actually put it in the overlay role, which says make one graph, in this case, one bar for each level of that social media trust variable. Now, instead of having them side by side under bar style, I will change that to stacked. And instead of depicting the count, what I want to do now is have it depict something that we call percent of factor. So that is the percentage share for each social media trust level within each age. And so when I select that, now you'll see each one totals 100% and shows that relative proportion, which as we've been doing before, we could label by value to get those percentages overlaid there. Now, the one thing that this graph doesn't do is capture the different uh, sample sizes for the different age groups. We know that there are fewer people in the 18 to 29 age range than the others. And if we want a graph that will depict that, we can build something known as a uh, mosaic, which is like that stacked bar chart, but it shows the relative proportion of our grouping variable. So we begin like we did before. I'll take age and put it on the X. But now we take social media trust, and instead of putting it in the overlay, we put it on the Y and select the mosaic. And so you'll notice this looks very similar to that stacked bar chart, but the width of each category represents the relative proportion of people in the different age groups. So this is, I think, a little more informative than that stacked bar chart. Again, we could label by percentages if we want. So that's just uh, a couple uh, different visualization options for when you're looking at two categorical variables, or in this case, really probably a grouping variable by responses to some uh, categorical survey item. And of course, there are more visuals that one might build, but I think these common ones will get you a long way in visualizing your survey data. So I'm going to pause here just a second, Kevin, take a sip of water and see what questions uh, have come in thus far. Um, Ross, you're nailing it because there is not a question yet. <laughs> well, that can mean one of two things, but we'll go with the nailing it. <laughs> yes, um, I'm going to vote for yes. that. All right, great. Thanks. Well, uh, all right, everybody, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A. I see one little uh, clapping uh, emoji floating on my screen, so glad to know somebody thinks uh, that wasn't the uh, the case here. Um, and we'll keep on moving with uh, summarizing and analyzing our survey data. Didn't mean to double-click that. Okay. Now, first, by summarization, uh, let's Think of the univariate case. We just want a univariate summary and maybe analysis of each individual variable. If you're a jump user, you probably already know that that's the distribution platform under the analyze menu. But if not, let me introduce you to that platform. I'm going to go to analyze distribution and let's just choose these group trust variables. So let's say I just want a basic univariate uh, summary and analysis for each one. So I'll put them into the Y columns role and click OK. And the distribution platform automatically produces for me uh, bar charts and frequency tables for each one. So trust in national news, I can see uh, we had 2,295 respondents select a lot. That was nearly 19% of our respondents. The most frequent was some 5,500 respondents, uh, approximately 46%, and so forth. And so this is a great way. I've only done three variables here, but you can summarize very quickly all of your uh, either categorical or as uh, I'm not showing, uh, continuous variables all in the distribution platform right here. And you can perform additional uh, analyses. Maybe you want to do a chi-square goodness of fit test if you have some hypothesis about how the uh, share of responses should be distributed. That would be under test probabilities. I think perhaps most commonly in this scenario, you might want confidence intervals on those proportions. And so I'll select the 95% confidence interval on each one of these here. And so now I can see, for example, that some being the most common at uh, nearly 46% has a confidence interval of uh, about 45% to 46%, 46 46.4. So in the distribution platform and all of Jump's analysis platforms, the workflow is like I just showed, where you launch the tool, you declare which variables belong in the analysis and what role they play, and then you use these red triangles to request uh, additional outputs beyond the default ones. And so the distribution platform itself is where you should go for all of your univariate summaries and analyses. 
One thing I want to point out here, if you remember, we set a certain column early on as a multiple response column. And that would be, let's see, under social media use. And this is the one where people could select all of the different social media platforms that they use. And that's actually, uh, to be honest, that's a column that I created after the fact from this data set. It wasn't included in the original Pew survey. But now if I put that into the distribution platform, I want to highlight that the output will be a little different. So you get your bar chart, but now instead of the standard frequency table, you get a multiple response frequency table, which will show you for each level, let's just go with Facebook, the count of respondents who selected that one. So 8,619. If we look at rate per case, this is the proportion of respondents who chose that. So you could take the 8,619 divided by the total cases, which is the total number of respondents, 12,147, and you will get this number right here. You also have the share of responses. So each person could have more than one response. They could select more than one social media platform. So if you take the 8,619 Facebook responses and divide it by the total number of responses across all 12,000 individuals, you will get this number right here. So for multiple response uh, items, you will get a slightly different distribution report out that is a little more uh, informative uh, specifically for that response type. So I just wanted to point that out. Now, uh, the next thing we might want to do with our survey data is perform some basic cross tabulations. We actually saw an example at the outset. So it was this table right here, where in this case, we have uh, nested grouping variables, age and education level. And again, we are looking at the results for uh, the question regarding how frequently people discuss politics from nearly every day to uh, less often than a few times a month. And what we have here is percentages and counts within each row. So you would read this table like this. Among uh, 18 to 29-year-olds who have at least a college degree, 20% of those people chose less often for discussing politics. 34% chose a few times a month. 32% chose a few times a week and so forth. And those percentages correspond to the actual counts in parentheses here. So let's see how I made this table uh, to get an idea of, in general, how uh, making these uh, custom cross tabs work in Jump. So I'm gonna use the tabulate tool here. Let me select it in my notes here. You'll find it as the third option under the analyze menu. So this is drag and drop like graph builder. So you can select variables. I'll start with our age variable and then drag them into different drop zones in the table to start building your table. Here, I'm gonna put age in the drop zone for rows. So jump has now just simply given me the count of individuals in each age group. We also had education level. You'll see that if I drag education level over, let's say over top age, just behind it, you can see it's actually highlighting the whole region. If I let go, it'll actually replace age with education level. Let me undo that. If I drag it just to the left or just to the right, I can create a nested grouping here. And so now I have the count of individuals in each of these groups defined by both age and education. And now finally, we had discuss politics as our uh, item of interest. So I'm gonna take that and now Declared as a grouping variable up top here. So I'll replace where it says N. And so now I have the count within each group of individuals for each response level. We actually had the uh, percentage within each row in our example. So I'm going to take in our list of statistics here, row percent, and put that into the table instead. And so now we have those row percentages as we had in the example. Now, we also had the uh, count in parentheses, so the count, uh, N here, I can add to the table, much like I added education level, I can put it in just to the right or left of row percentage, and now I have these two statistics in the table. And finally, I can even select columns for multiple statistics, right-click and go to Pack Columns and choose Pack, and it will put them in a single column according to uh, some formatting, in this case, the count being in parentheses. So if I right click and go to pack columns, I can actually change the template. 
And so using the different ways that you can nest uh, different grouping variables, putting different questions going row-wise versus column-wise, all of these different summary statistics, you can create highly customized uh, cross-tab tables in this tabulate platform. I mean, we could spend, and in fact, a little while ago, well, a couple of years at this point, I did an entire hour-long webinar on just tabulate. Uh, it's a really robust tool for your cross-tab tables. For the sake of time, I'm not going to show it anymore. Uh, other than to say, uh, once I click done here, these actually are great for dropping directly into a, a document if you're actually writing up a report. What I recommend doing is going to the tools menu, activating the selection tool, which allows you to highlight the entire table and on right click, you can copy it and then paste it directly into say a Word document. And it'll actually be pasted as an editable Word table so that you can make other formatting changes or maybe change some of these labels if you haven't already done it in tabulate, which you can. So uh, just a quick comment on how to get these uh, tabulation tables uh, out into your reports here. Now let's talk about uh, analyses. And I want to begin with just simple pairwise analyses. So for example, looking for a statistical relationship between uh, discussion of politics and age. So for that, we're going to use a tool called FitYByX, and we're going to produce this analysis. <clears throat> So here we have age as our grouping variable, or our X. Discuss politics as our Y. We have a mosaic plot, which we saw before. Uh, it's using a, an ordinal coloring scheme that I've declared so that we have uh, at less often a light colored uh, purple all the way to a dark colored purple for nearly every day. We have a, a contingency table, or might call a cross tabs table down below. Uh, you can use this key to actually read the table. So count just means literally the number of individuals. So 307 total individuals were in the young age group and responded less often. The total percentage is just the total percentage across all people. So if you took the 307 individuals divided by the 12,000 total, you would get 2.54%. We saw a row percentage. That's the bottom one before in that crosstab table. So this is within the row, so within the young age group, the percentage of different response categories. And then this third one, which we haven't talked about yet, the column percentage is just the percentage uh, within the column. So within the less often respondents, 11.3% uh, of them were in the young age group, 40% were in the 30 to 49, and so forth all the way down. So that's how you read this table. And then finally, we have statistical tests down below. So these are chi-square tests of independence. So it's a test against the null hypothesis that there's no relationship between age and the breakdown of responses to this discuss politics question. So a statistically significant result suggests that the different age groups have different proportions of responses or uh, shares in the different categories. We have both the uh, Pearson and likelihood ratio tests here. There are two common chi-square tests of independence. Both of them are statistically significant, where we can see highlighted in orange here, where we're looking typically for a p-value less than 0.05, and here they're both less than 0 0.0001. So let's see how I launched this analysis, and then we'll learn a little bit more about the outputs. So I'm going to go to Analyze, Fit Y by X. I'm going to take Age and say that's my X variable. Discuss Politics, that's my Y variable. Click OK. And because both of these had an ordinal modeling type, Jump automatically produces the full analysis for me. So we're right back to where we started. But there are, of course, many red triangle options all over Jump, including when we're performing these contingency analyses as we are here. So for example, perhaps you want to pull up the measures of association, which is a table of different uh, single values summarizing the degree of association between these two variables. We may want to actually customize our contingency table. So for example, if you want to pull up the expected frequency in each cell, you could just select that. And then at this point, I think there are two general purpose jump tools that I would like to highlight. First being, uh, well, let me set the stage here. We performed the uh, discuss politics by age analysis, but we have many different items that we may want to get a quick view of how they relate to age. So instead of having to go back to fit Y by X and uh, declare a new Y variable in this analysis, what I'm going to do is go to the red triangle and under redo, pull up a tool called the column switcher. 
So instead of discuss politics, I want to be able to analyze, discuss politics, follow news, these uh, group trust variables, and some others. And when I click OK, I now have this interactive list that allows me to update what that Y variable is, and all of the graphs and analyses update automatically as I select them. So for example, if we go back to get news from television, you can see in dark being the more frequent or often response, uh, we can see getting news from television is more frequent the older that individuals get. Again, perhaps not too surprising. Now, one other thing we might want to do uh, is actually drill down into subsets of individuals. So this is people of all ages, but maybe I want to perform this test only on a subset of individuals. So let's instead uh, pull up our local data filter here. And under our demographics, I'm going to say, well, instead of looking at uh, all people, let's actually look at males and females separately. So here are the uh, responses for all those who selected uh, a man as the gender they uh, identify with. Now we can update to just a woman or uh, folks that chose in some other way and see the differences here. So the local data filter and column switcher are great ways to update your analyses, drill down into subgroups on the fly in whatever graph or analysis you're doing. We've just seen them in the context of fit Y by X here. I see a question that just came in that I think now is a good time to answer as we're talking about some of these things. And it says, is it easy to combine groups? It's useful if there are groups with few responses. And that's exactly right. Maybe there are a few groups that are so small you want to combine them with others. A great way to do that is recode. Um, let's see, I'll just choose a, any old column for the sake of demonstration. So I'm going to go to recode on Trust National News. And let's say that what I want to do is combine everybody who says they trust national news to at least some degree versus the people who said not at all. I can select all three and click group. And then we'll say, we'll actually just leave that as some versus not at all. And if I click recode, I now have a new column that's collapsed those response categories. Now, if you want to get even fancier, there is a column property. Let's see if I can find it here called, uh, I think it's super categories. It's been a little while since I've used it. Yep, right down here. So you can also declare super categories on top of an existing column so that when you analyze it, it will analyze all the individual response levels and then also at the level of the super categories uh, that you declare. All right, so let's talk the categorical platform now. I, I hinted at this at the beginning and that it's a tool meant for mass analysis of many categorical uh, responses at one time. And we saw a simple example, and I'm gonna actually pull up a simple example now to first contrast what this platform does compared to what we just did in Fit Y by X uh, to give you an idea of what makes it so useful for survey analysis specifically. You're going to find the categorical platform under consumer research here sitting at the top. And you're going to notice this is a pretty uh, feature-rich launch dialog. And that's because while what this platform essentially does is graph and analyze categorical response data. So uh, think about you know share charts, contingency tables, um, chi-square tests. It's made to handle data that can come in many different formats and many uh, made to handle many different ways in which you might want to declare grouping variables or analyze questions together or separately. And so all of the features that you're really seeing here control those kinds of things. What I'm going to do is first reproduce the analysis we just did in fit Y by X. So I'm going to say age is my X variable or my grouping variable. Discuss politics is the response I want to analyze. And I'm going to click OK. So what do we have here? Well, again, here we have our cross tabs. You should re recognize some of these numbers. For example, the 307 individuals responding uh, less often, uh, individuals from the 18 to 29 age range. Here we have a share chart specifically formatted for ordinal data. So the dark purple here again stands for nearly every day. And we can see the proportion of that getting uh, larger, the older people get. So older people seem to be discussing politics every day more frequently than the younger folks. And under the red triangle, you'll notice I have a number of additional options for pulling up more summary information, uh, additional visualizations, or performing statistical tests. So in this case, I'm going to say test response homogeneity, which is going to perform the uh, likelihood ratio and Pearson chi-square tests. 
So let's pull up that fit Y by X report that we looked at a few minutes ago, because I just want to highlight that we've essentially reproduced this analysis uh, that we did in fit Y by X. For example, compare the likelihood ratio chi-square value 445.4 to this one right here, 445.4. We've literally done the exact same statistical test. So why have two different tools that can do the same thing? Well, it's because, as I hinted at when I pulled up this red triangle, the categorical platform is really made to handle survey data and specific types of outputs you might want. So for example, in addition to testing the response homogeneity, I could choose compare each sample. And what that's going to do is do pairwise tests of each age group against another. So when I choose compare each sample, I now have at the bottom of my report, this additional matrix of p-values comparing each age group against the other. For example, here, A versus B, the p-value 0.0848 for the likelihood ratio test or 0.0871 for the Pearson test. This appears to be the only pairwise test that's not significant at the 0.05 level. Now, I said group A versus group B. We can just consult the table, which now has letter codings helpfully added to it. And so that's the comparison between the uh, 18 to 29 and 30 to 49 age groups. And if we look at the share chart, we're basically saying, does the breakdown of response proportions differ across these groups? Uh, it doesn't look like I have statistical evidence that they do. Numerically, they're a little different, uh, but statistically, I don't have evidence that they are. So I personally like to consume this uh, matrix of p-values to determine who's different from who or what group is different from another, but you also have this comparison column up here, which can help you do that. So you read it like this. Let's say we have 50 to 64, and it just has A in its compare column. What that means is that this group is statistically different from group A, which is the 18 to 29 group. And the capital means it's statistically significantly different at the 0.05 level. You'll actually notice up at B here, we have a lowercase a. If you remember, that p-value is about 0.08 comparing the A to B groups. The lowercase means statistically significant at the 0.1 level. And now you'll notice A doesn't even have any letters here, and that's because we don't duplicate letters. The letters go to the uh, group with the larger share of responses. So A is the smallest group. We saw that before, the young people just over a thousand of them total. And so if we want to know, does A differ from somebody with more responses, let's say the 30 to 49 again, we would look to the comparison uh, column for that group. But again, if you're saying, well, that started to get a little confusing, it's going to take me a moment to figure out exactly how to parse that. That's why, again, I personally like just reading directly this matrix of p-values here and then mapping that back to the letter codes. So that's just one additional option in the categorical platform. There are many others. Uh, another good one is the cell chi-square. This will actually provide p-values at the level of the individual cell, and they're color-coded so that if we see a cell with a small and bright red p-value, that means we have a higher frequency or higher proportion of um, observations in that cell than we would expect if, uh, in this case, age and discuss politics were unrelated. A uh, low p-value in blue means that the uh, proportion is smaller than we would expect if, again, there's no relationship between age and discuss politics. So, for example, here in group C, we have uh, mostly non-significant p-values. So for less often a few times a month and a few times a week, those are the proportions we would expect uh, if age and discuss politics weren't related. But here we do see a slightly higher a proportion than we might expect for specifically nearly every day. So that means basically this uh, dark purple proportion is a little bit higher than we would expect uh, if there were no relationship. So I'm not going to go through more of the red triangle options here. There are many, many uh, contained in the categorical platform, all really built to help us handle um, the different scenarios encountered when uh, analyzing uh, mass categorical data found in surveys. Uh, Ross, I just I sure. just popped into the oh to everybody I just popped into the chat window a link to our help documentation on this platform. I mean, it is a huge platform with lots of capabilities, different data formats, survey types, analysis objectives. So, uh, if you want to learn more, to uh, take a look at uh, that link I just sent. Great, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you doing that um, because that's something that I 
uh, had forgotten to mention, but I will now. That link is in the chat, and it's also right here in the journal, which you'll all be able to download uh, after uh, we send you this follow-up email that lets you know that the materials and recording are available. Uh, you can also, if I go to the categorical platform launch, you can click this help button to get directly to that documentation. And without getting into all of the details of all these options here, I want to give you a basic idea of one of the big ones right up here and why we have four different tabs and the different scenarios that they can handle. So I actually just did the simple tab at first. And what this does is uh, analyzes uh, one or more responses completely independently of the others. So for example, let's say I put news media types in there. So I have five different questions. And then I had age as my grouping variable. When I click OK, what's going to happen is I'm going to get a separate analysis for each one. So here's get news from television by age, from radio by age, and so forth. So in this case, five completely independent analyses. The next tab says related. So let's pull that up. Related means uh, responses or items that are all measured on the same scale. So if we look, let's say, at that group trust again, trust national, local, and social media, they're all measured on the same scale right here. A lot, some, not too much, or not at all. So what I could do is say that these are aligned responses. Aligned means the same response levels. And again, put age in here, and then perform an analysis where we're analyzing statistically each of these responses separately, but our contingency table and our share chart combine across all of them. Now, I will note that this can also handle in this related tab repeated measures. So that is asking individuals the same question over different periods of time and also rater agreement. So maybe what each column represents is a different rater's response to an item. So here's what that looks like. Three different items, but all in the same table and chart. And then, of course, the ability still to do that test response homogeneity and others. And in this case, you see we get three separate tests. One thing I'll point out when you do multiple tests pays to know that under test options, you can turn on false discovery rate controls here. Uh, so with three, it's not that big of a deal. But if you're analyzing 50 items at once, you may want to turn this option on so that the p-values in that table at the bottom have false discovery rate control applied. Now, for the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to show any more in the categorical platform. I will just mention that the multiple tab there is specifically for analyzing multiple response items. So again, that's the choose all that apply type. And structured is a way for you to declare a custom structure to your uh, cross tab or your contingency table and the corresponding tests. So all these others assume a specific structure and can handle most situations. But if you have a uh, a particularly customized or complex structure you want to impose on that table, you can go ahead and use this structured tab. But I'm going to leave the categorical platform at that and let you know again, go ahead and check out the documentation. If you're actually using it to uh, analyze any of your survey data and you need help, uh, we can always help you at academic at jump.com or at community.jump.com. Uh, you can uh, find our user community where many questions about the categorical platform have already been asked and answered. Now, we have just a few minutes left, which is kind of what I expected, uh, but to discuss uh, analyzing free response items. So those items where somebody can just type whatever response they want into an open text field. The uh, American Trends Panel data that we were looking at uh, didn't have any of those questions, but this is another real survey uh, that does. So this is a survey from back in 2013. The city of Toronto was considering constructing a new casino and they released a survey for people to indicate whether or not they're in favor of constructing the casino. I've actually collapsed response categories across, I think it was a, a five level Likert scale um, to just two levels here, whether they're in favor, yes or no. And then we also have their stated reasons. So row number one, they said, no, they're not in favor. And that's because they say, I don't want to promote irresponsible gambling for the local community. Uh, person number two, however, was in favor. And why? Well, economic development, jobs, arts, and culture. And so we may want to find useful information in these free responses. For example, what terms best predict whether somebody's in favor or not? So to analyze uh, free text data, you want to use uh, the Text Explorer platform that you're going to find under the Analyze menu right here. So I'm going to go to Analyze Text Explorer. I'm going to put this Q1B, which contains all of the free text data, into the Text Columns role. 
You'll notice the little icon next to it actually looks kind of like a little cartoon of some text. That's another um, modeling type that you can declare in Jump uh, is unstructured text data, which I've done here. I'll click OK. And what Jump first does is tokenizes the text. So that is, it breaks up all of the individual terms in the text and counts them up. So city is actually the most common term. It occurs 7,243 times. If you've ever analyzed text data before, you know that one of the first steps is to uh, essentially throw out the terms that are not meaningful in your analysis. For example, the city name Toronto. We're talking about a casino in Toronto, so I don't know if that's very informative. Maybe the term casino isn't informative either. So I might select those and right click and say add stop word, and it will uh, remove those from the analyses. There are also uh, particular phrases we might want to declare as terms themselves. So for example, world class, uh, this is kind of a compound uh, adjective here. And so I might right click and say add phrase, and now it's going to treat world class as a term in our term list for further visualization and analysis. Most of your time analyzing text data involves going through and declaring stop words and phrases. But uh, I'm going to pull up a version of this where we've already done that. So I've cleaned up. I've added a lot of phrases like slot machines, world class, long term, Niagara Falls. I've declared stop words, and I've also turned on something called stemming, which is an option in the launch dialog. And all that does is collapse across grammatical forms of a word. So here we have addict. And really, it's for addict, addicted, addictive, addiction, all of these forms of the same word. And I've turned on something uh, called a word cloud, which we're probably familiar with. And you can find the word cloud under the display options right here, and then it's customizable. So you can format it in this circular format as we've done here, and even color it by a variable. So I've uh, declared a color variable using the coloring options so that uh, red indicates people uh, more strongly opposed and blue indicates people more strongly in favor. And you can see, uh, addict or addiction, strongly read, people who mention addiction are probably not in favor of the casino, where people who mention jobs are. And now I can actually verify that statistically. What I'm going to do is right-click on, let's say, both of these terms and go to uh, Save Indicators. That actually writes two indicator variables back to my data table. So here we have, a, in this case, a 1 if somebody mentioned uh, addiction and a zero if they didn't, or a one if they mentioned jobs and a zero if they didn't. You'll notice they come out as uh, continuous columns because it's just ones and zeros. So I might, as I did at the outset, form a little cleanup and say these are actually nominal. And then I can take those and throw them into other tools. For example, let's just do a quick fit Y by X where we look at both of these as X variables and then in favor as our Y. And I can see a pretty clear pattern here. So the yeses are in blue. So we have far more yeses when people don't mention uh, addiction than when they do. And that's a statistically significant result. And on the right, we have far more yeses when they mention jobs than when they don't. And that's also a statistically significant result. So it's pretty easy to get some basic information out of these text data through these indicator columns. But I do want to point out that there are some uh, other more, uh, let's say, advanced options as well, if you have Jump Pro, things like topic analysis or sentiment analysis or a tool that we call term selection, which automatically mines all of the terms to find those that are most predictive of a particular outcome. And you'll find all of those under the red triangle in this section here. But for the sake of time, we'll leave it at just those indicator columns, which everybody, even if you're in standard Jump, has access to. So that is... Uh, everything I was hoping to say regarding survey analysis fundamentals, and of course, there's a lot more to survey analysis, perhaps, depending on your scenario. For example, more advanced methods like factor analysis or structural equation modeling or multiple correspondence analysis or performing longitudinal analyses on a panel that's been measured at multiple points in time. So this really is just the fundamentals, everything you need to know in Jump to get started. If you want to learn more about survey analysis in Jump, we'd be happy to help you out. You can always email us at academic at jump.com with questions or maybe to arrange a learning session for um, you and your academic colleagues.